Hello. I'd like to tell you a story. Or to be more precise, I'd like to share with you a collection of stories that goes back almost 300 years. My involvement with the story started on February 18th, 2014, when I was invited to attend a series of kite festivals in the Far East, in Malaysia and Thailand. I flew out to Singapore, where I met several of the uh, invited flyers, and we travelled north to the first festival on the list, Basia Gadam. Travelling north to Kedah and north again up into Thailand for Satoon. It was in Kedah that I first met Mr. Andreas Hagran, a renowned designer and flyer originally from Sweden but now living in Bali. On my tours around kite festivals, I usually record uh, the uh, guests, the flyers, the designers uh, in a, an album on my Facebook page and if there's a story involved uh, that makes it all the more interesting. And on this particular festival in Kedah, Andreas had an incredible story. He was flying two kites, two arrow shaped kites. A black one pointing up and a red one pointing down. These two kites were tethered to one line. This line was cut and the kites disappeared over the horizon. An extensive search was launched but we ne they never found the kites and they were deemed lost forever. That was until a flyer returning back to the festival saw the kites in the middle of a field. So he rescued them brought them back and owner and uh, uh, kites were reunited. Andreas then, later on in the day, launched them again. And being satisfied that they were flying securely and stable, he decided to go and replenish his water bottle. Whilst he was gone, the wind dropped and the kites started floating back to earth. Before they, before they reached the earth, they got entangled with the national grid system. But that's another story. On my return home, I noticed on Facebook that several of the flyers that were at the festivals in Malaysia and Thailand were now touring China. One photograph in particular caught my eye. On this photograph is Edo Baghetti from Italy and Jamched Babalu from India and Andreas sat on a settee in the foyer of a hotel in China. Next to them there was an empty chair and jokingly I wrote on Andreas's timeline please put my name on that empty chair. The dialogue that followed goes like this. Tell me Andreas how on earth did you get to be on a, uh, a tour of kite festivals in China? Oh that's easy he said, I organised the tour. Then you're the man that I want to speak to, I said. And it's that dialogue that got me invited along to the next festival in 2015 in China. My first trip to China was in 2015 when a group of international kite flares met in the town of Kongxin in the province of Sichuan in southwest China for a four festival tour. Visiting the cities of Chongqing, Xi'an, Beijing and Waifang. After a very cold and damp start 
to our tour in the fairy mountains of Ching Chongqing. We travel north to Xi'an, a fantastic city where we met a group of remarkable kinetic kite builders. But that's another story. Moving on north, we arrived in Beijing, where our number increased to 12. This is where my main story is set. During the period between festivals, we were taken to many interesting and historic um, places. One of our visits was to a kite manufacturing establishment, the Shang Xiong Kite Factory, that produced handmade traditional Chinese kites. After a tour of the workshops, we were taken into the showrooms where many kites were on display and given the history of how this establishment had grown from very humble beginnings. On leaving, we had a chance to meet Kong Ling Ming, the owner and manager of the establishment. Kong Ling Ming had inherited the love of traditional kites from his father, Kong Jiang Zhe. More about Kong Ling Ming later, as my main story will now concentrate on Kong Jiang Zhe. There are several versions of this story and I will try to explain the most logical. Kong Xiangzi was born in 1920, the son of Kong Fanjin, a commander-in-chief of the Sanji Gansu border defence. Kong is the surname of the family that traces back to Confucius, one of China's most famous philosophers. For thousands of years, emperors regarded him to be the greatest sage, whose direct descendants were given inheritable titles through various dynasties. During the Ming Dynasty, a Kong family descendant moved from Shandong to Hefei, Kong family members then wrote to Kong Fan Jin, who was born in Jinan, the uh, provincial capital. He had become a trusted high-level official in the imperial court and a senior general guard in Gansu province. The members told their influential relative that the, the ancestral temple in Haifei needed to be repaired and renovated. The general replied that it would be better to rebuild the structure into a larger one. He sent them a large amount of money, which was used to construct buildings with more than 60 rooms. On a 2,500 square metre site, the Kong family boasts the world's longest recorded history. The patrilineal family tree, now in its 83rd generation, has been recorded since the death of Confucius. As a young man, Kong Zianze was obsessed with fine art, although his father objected. He went on to study sculpture and art at the Bihau Academy of Fine Arts. While at university studying under a Japanese professor, China being under the Japanese rule at that time, 1937-1945, he was sent to an antique dealer to view a collection of manuscripts. Written by the author Kao Yatsin, who was a Chinese writer during the Qing Dynasty, 1636 to 1912. He is best known as the writer of The Dream of the Red Chamber, one of the four great classical novels of Chinese literature. The eight manuscripts were handwritten and set to document ways that ordinary citizens could make a living out of various crafts. 
Because the professor and Conde André were interested in kites, Conde André was given permission to copy volume 2 of the manuscripts, but prohibited to use photography. After 26 days, the eight volumes were taken back to Japan and never seen again. The story goes that Kao Yetsun was approached by a friend who had fallen on hard times. His friend asked Kao to teach him to make kites. Kao agreed and later his friend returned to his own village. A couple of years later Kao Yetsun was passing through the village and stopped to see his friend. The friend had become a successful kite maker and was able to support his family and pay off his debts. Cow decided then to write a book on making kites as a way to help others who needed a skill. He saw it as a much better way to help people in trouble rather than just give them money. A skill allows people to help themselves and make their own lives better. Taking this a stage further to eight volumes. Konji Anze is the 83rd generation direct descendant of the philosopher Confucius and spent 40 years perfecting the art of building traditional Chinese kites from the information taken from volume 2 of the 8 volumes written by Kao Yatsin during the Qing dynasty. During the early years Konji Anze taught Hu Yai, the last Chinese emperor to build and fly kites. He was so appreciative of these skills that he insisted that his kites were called cow kites and not con kites. Kongzi Anzi never made a living from building kites but sought to keep alive the ancient traditions of Chinese kite building. During the Cultural Revolution he became a prime target for the revolutionaries whose sole intentions were to rid China of old traditions and start everything anew. He was beaten six times, losing consciousness on several occasions, and all his possessions trashed. Konzianzi took refuge in the northeast all by himself, and as his ambition of promoting cow kites were first forced to stop. Konzianzi persevered, but it was not until 1977 did he take up the task of producing the collections of waste each side poor translation which will be better translated to the collected manuscripts of lost art, now known as Fair Nitz High Collection. In 1979, Kong Zianzi held a kite festival in the Summer Palace in Beijing and later cow family kites were displayed at the Beijing Flower and Kite Fair early 1980, attracting many visitors. Then, in 1984, Kong Zianzi assisted in the building of the first Kao Yatsin Memorial Hall to display the kites. Since then, the kites have been awarded prizes successfully, both at domestic and international contests and fairs. Throughout this period, Kong Zianzi encouraged his son, Kong Lingmin, and his grandson, Kong Bingzhang, along with many kite enthusiasts, to take up the challenge of promoting cow kites. In 2011, the Cow Cow craftsmanship was included in the Cultural Heritage Protection List. And in 2018, 42 kites, co copied by Kong Zianzi, Kong Ling Min, and Kong Bing Zhang, were officially entered. Kong Ling Min managed the family business for many years, which was solely aimed at producing kites. Now, in the 21st century, the emphasis has changed. The Changzhou Kite Factory has now become one of four training centres for building of kites while Kong Ling Min teaches kite building from home. His kites being collector's items command high prices. Kong Bin Zhan on the other hand has become a school teacher but still finds time to build kites. 
I'd now like to share with you a video of the um, Shang Jung Kite Factory, which uh, the group of international flyers visited in 2015.
Uh, with, with my phone, yes. Please. Huh? With my phone, yes. Oh, sorry. But it's going Wait. to video again. No. Is it video?